So uh, the speaker, our speaker of this afternoon is Yanis Loizides, and he will be speaking on Hamiltonian loop group spaces and the theorem of uh, Kellerman and Woodward. So Yanis, I now mute myself and change, uh, change the setup and I'll give you the floor. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's, it's a pleasure. It's too bad that uh, I can't be there with all of you, but um, this, I guess, is the next best thing. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about this, um, this a very interesting paper from, from uh, several years ago by Telemann and Woodward called the index formula on the moduli of G bundles. Um, and they proved this, I think, quite amazing, quite amazing formula. So um, they, they were studying the moduli space of, say, holomorphic G bundles on a on a compact surface, on a compact Riemann surface. And um, and they were studying certain K theory classes on that on that moduli space or moduli stack. And uh, they they defined some kind of index of these K theory classes and proved a really amazing uh, formula for the index, uh, which generalizes the, the Verlin formula, for example, if you, if, you, um, if you don't twist by any auxiliary K theory class, then um, you recover the, the Verlin formula. But, but in their formula, you can twist by these more, um, more general K theory classes. Um, so, so it's a considerably more general formula. Um, and it's kind of, you could view it as a K-theoretic version of um, some chromological formulas that were conjectured by, by Witten and then proved by Jeffrey Kirwan um, in the SUM case and, and, and also Mein Rankin for more general groups. Um, so, so they studied, I guess, people refer to them as intersection pairings on the moduli space um, for kind of ordinary cohomology. And you could ask, what about other cohomology theories, in particular K theory? And the Telemann Woodward theorem is kind of the K theoretic analog of that. Um, and, and one of the interesting, uh, more recent applications uh, was to the equivariant Verlin formula um, a few years ago. So this was, uh, so, so this is a formula for the moduli space um, of Higgs bundles, kind of version of the Verlin formula for the moduli space of Higgs bundles. It was conjectured by um, Gukov and Dupe, and then um, and then proved by by various authors, uh, Gukov, Dupe, and Anderson, also Halpern and Leisner. Um, and I also uh, saw that there's a paper by I think Hausel, Mellet, and Dupe. Um, so there was a lot of excitement about this about this formula. Um, and it's um, yeah, it it it's it's closely related to the Telemann Woodward formula. Um, so the, the equivariant Verlin formula involves applying the Telemann Woodward formula and then proving some um, quite non-trivial uh, vanishing results for higher cohomology and um, a QR equals zero result. Um, anyways, I'm not, I'm not really gonna talk about that, but that's an interesting application. Um, and uh, so, so, so I was really interested in Trying to trying to understand this um, this result, uh, so they Telemann and Woodward use um, mostly use algebra geometric methods. Um, there's a lot of discussion of there's a lot of uh, discussion of stacks and and uh, and things like that. And um, but but I'm more of a symplectic or differential geometer, uh, also doing some analysis. So I was really coming at it from that perspective, trying to understand it from that perspective. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to um, try to extend the result to more general Hamiltonian loop group spaces. So if you saw Eckert Meinrenken's talk uh, yesterday, he, he introduced, he talked quite a bit about Hamiltonian loop group spaces. And uh, I think he explained briefly how, how, the, moduli, how the moduli spaces of, um, of flat connections uh, give examples of such spaces. Um, but but there are other examples which he mentioned briefly um, briefly yesterday. Um, so I was interested in in whether this result could be extended to Hamiltonian more general Hamiltonian loop group spaces. Um, so 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about these moduli spaces gauge theoretically. So I'm going to be thinking about them in terms of moduli spaces of flat connections, sort of going back to Atiyah Bhatt and Donaldson. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so as I mentioned, I'm not, I'm not an algebraic geometer, so I won't be taking the, the um, same perspective as uh, Telemann and Woodward where they're thinking about the moduli stack of polymorphic GC bundles. Um, I'll be thinking about it more uh, gauge theoretically. And what I'm going to talk about uh, builds, on, builds on some earlier work with Eckhard Mann Rankin and, and uh, Yan Li Song. Um, which I'll mention in due course, I guess, um, when it when it comes up. And then, um, yeah, and, and I guess while, while I'm mentioning intellectual debt, I, I think I should also mention the work of Pardon and Vern. So I use, I, I, I'm using some of their ideas in, in key places. Um, and also, um, Michel Vern was actually the per first person who who pointed out this work on the equivariant Berlin formula to me when I was still kind of um, a young graduate student, and um, and and it was it was completely over my head at the time, <laughs> but um, yeah, but but uh, when she pointed it out to me, it 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 definitely stuck in my mind, um, and uh, I've been intrigued by it since then. Um, and, and of course, uh, yeah, I have a big debt to Eckhart Meinrich, and he was my PhD advisor, and a lot of what I understand about Hamiltonian loop group spaces comes, comes from him. Um, and then, yeah, I want to emphasize this is, this is work in progress. Um, I, I, I decided to take a bit of a risk and talk about something that's not, um, not completely done yet, which I'm not sure was the, the best idea in, in hindsight, but... Um, but uh, in, in favor of that, it means I can talk about something that I'm still um, quite excited about rather than something I'm already um, a little bit bored with. Um, and yeah, in, in, in particular, um, I have to admit that uh, even, even in the last couple of days, I, I had a small crisis and realized that one of the things I wanted to tell you, I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if it's true or not. So. I had to scale back. Um, I had to scale back the talk a little bit at the last minute. Um, so yeah. So I wanted to emphasize that it's work in progress, and uh, I, I hope I hope I won't tell you anything that's uh, completely wrong. But um, yeah, uh, Yanis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like work in progress covers all that. So no worries. <laughs> tell us everything. Okay. Well, okay. Um, well, I, I, I did I did try to scale back to talk a little bit to try to keep to things that I, I I'm confident uh, I'm I'm more confident that there's there's no gap in the proof. There's one thing in particular I realized there's there's a gap. I don't know if it's I don't know that it's false, but but there's definitely a gap. So that that I think I will leave leave out of the talk. <laughs> um, right. Um, what is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Um, yeah, work in progress, yeah. Um, okay, um, yeah, and I, actually for the same reason, so part of my talk is going to be neatly organized in slides, somewhat neatly organized in slides, and part is going to veer into more Blackboard talk style, and this is to some extent for the same, for the same reason. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, enough, enough of that, um, I'll start by reviewing Hamiltonian loop group spaces. So Eckhart talked about this um, yesterday, so I'll maybe go over it somewhat rapidly. Um, so what are Hamiltonian loop group spaces? So I'm gonna fix a compact, connected, simply connected, and simple Lie group, which I'll call G. So an example is SUN. And uh, Gothic G is the Lie algebra. And there's, there's, there's um, up to a scale factor, there's a unique add invariant inner product on the Lie algebra. And uh, there's a unique, there's a unique one with this, um, with this uh, requirement that um, the dot product of the long roots is two, uh, of a long root with itself is two. Okay, so that fixes the scaling. This is called the basic inner product. And I'm going to use that to identify G and G star through, throughout the talk. 
And then, um, so we write, I'm going to write LG for the group of maps from S1 to G, just with pointwise multiplication. And as Eckhart mentioned uh, briefly um, yesterday, really you want to fix like a Sobolev class. Sobolev class should be bigger, bigger than a half um, to make things work. Um, and, and later I'll actually want bigger than bigger than three halves for something. But anyways, I'm, I'm not going to mention this ever again in, in the talk because it's not important. Um, uh, this loop group has a Lie algebra, which um, we think we tend to think of as uh, G valued zero forms on the circle or G valued functions on the circle. And the dual of the Lie algebra, uh, well, kind of smooth dual is going to be Lie algebra valued one forms on the circle. This is kind of a definition. I don't know if you can see the little box. This is basically definition. The pairing between these two is given by this basic inner product that I mentioned before, followed by integration over the circle. When you when you pair something in here with something in here, you'll, you'll end up with a, a, one, a G valued one form on the circle, sorry, a, a one form on the circle, and then you can integrate it. Yeah. And the reason for thinking of it as one forms is basically because then we can think of them as connections on the trivial bundle over the circle. Okay, and I guess I just have a, const, uh, a small remark here that um, the, the Lie algebra, you can think of the Lie algebra naturally as a subspace inside here as, as the constant connection. I fix some, um, some uh, I guess, volume form on the circle. Um, that's kind of implicit here. Okay, and the loop group, the loop group is the gauge, is the gauge group over the circle. Um, so it acts on this space, LG star, this space of connections by gauge transformations. All this kind of appeared in Eckhart's talk yesterday. One thing that didn't appear in Eckhart's talk yesterday, um, at least I don't remember it appearing, was um, the loop group has, has a kind of famous central extension by, by U1. Um, and the co-cycle, I wrote down the formula for the co-cycle here. Um, so so there's, there's a kind of fundamental one um, which is when you take this constant, so this constant L is, is an integer. I guess I wrote that down. This constant L is an integer. If you put L equal to one, you get kind of the basic central extension. Um, and in general, um, yeah, in, in general, you can basically take tensor powers of that central extension. Okay. Um, right, so, so that will play us a role at some point. So now I'll just, review the definition of a Hamiltonian loop group space. This already appeared in Eckhart's talk yesterday. So it's a it's a Banach, it's a smooth Banach manifold with an with a smooth action of this loop group LG. Um, it should have an L invariant LG invariant weak symplectic form and a moment map. So the moment map goes from, from M to this LG star, this space of um, connections on the circle. And it should satisfy the usual uh, moment map condition here. And a key, a key thing that that uh, we're always assuming, going to be assuming, is that this moment map mu is is proper. Yeah. So Eckhart talked about this yesterday. It it gives you some control over this m. Basically, fibers are going to be finite dimensional and compact. Um, so, for example, reduced spaces, symplectic quotients of this space will end up being um, compact, finite dimensional. Okay. And the and the kind of uh, key example. Um, that I'll be thinking about uh, a lot throughout the talk is um, this one that's based on Riemann surfaces. So if you have if you have a compact connected oriented surface uh, with just a single boundary component, there's more general things that, that you can consider. Eckhart mentioned yesterday that you can have multiple boundary components. Um, for simplicity, I'm just going to restrict to the case of one boundary component. Um, then, you can look at the space of flat connections on the trivial bundle over the surface. Okay, that will be some infinite dimensional space. And it's acted on by the gauge group, by the set of maps from the surface into the group, into G. And there's, there's a normal subgroup of that gauge group. Um, you look at the normal subgroup. So, so uh, script G is my notation for the gauge group. And you can look at the normal subgroup of elements that restrict to the identity along the boundary. Yeah, so in, in the interior of the surface, they can be anything, um, but along the boundary, we're requiring that they be the identity. And uh, the Hamiltonian loop group space is the quotient of those two things. You take the flat connections 
on the surface divided by this normal subgroup of the gauge group. And uh, the result is still, so, so, so one reason for restricting to this normal subgroup is that this normal subgroup acts nicely uh, freely, it acts freely and properly on this space. Um, so that, uh, that ensures that the quotient is still nice. If you use the whole gauge group, that would not be the case. Okay, so this quotient is still infinite dimensional um, and it has a residual loop group action. Yeah, because we, we only took a quotient by, by a subgroup of the gauge group, we still have some of the gauge group kind of left over, so to speak. This, the fact that LGX actually uses the fact, our assumption that the group is simply connected. Um, so you need to take a, some uh, loop in the group, you need to extend it to the surface by contracting the loop to a point um, and then let it act. Uh, that's kind of how the action goes. So this is an LG space, and the moment map the moment map takes um, the gauge equivalence class of a connection to the restriction of that connection to the boundary, and that's well defined because um, we didn't mod out by the whole gauge group, just by this by this subgroup that's the identity along the boundary. Okay, so this this is going to be the key example for my talk, um, and maybe I'll just mention as a small aside. I'm not really going to talk about this, but um, the, the moduli stack of holomorphic GC bundles, GC is the complexification of um, the group on, on the closed Riemann surface, on the surface that you get by capping off the boundary, adding a disk to the boundary. Um, it's it, it's in, in, in some sense that, that um, that's maybe technical to spell out, in some sense, it's the quotient of M by um, the group L plus GC. What is L plus GC? So L plus GC is loops in the complexified group in GC that have um, a holomorphic extension to the disk, to the interior of the disk. That's what L plus GC is. Um, and that, that group actually acts on M and, um, and in some sense, uh, the, the moduli stack is this, is this quotient. Um, and, and kind of up to homotopy, if you just care about the homotopy type, um, L plus GC is, is, um, is, uh, is homotopic to G, just the group G itself. Um, so, so up to homotopy, this, this thing is, is M mod G. So, um, so, so, so kind of morally, morally speaking, the, the space whose topology we're interested in, you can think of as being the quotient of M by G. Um, okay, so so the, the Telemann Woodward formula is going to be about uh, about uh, the index of some more morally it's about the index of some k-theory classes on on the space, or if you like some g-equivariant k-theory classes on on, on the Hamiltonian loop group space. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, what, what I'm going to mean by index. So Telemann and Woodward have some method that's uh, quite algebra geometric of defining an index. Um, and uh, I, I have some different approach to this. Uh, so that's what I'll tell you about, about next, what I'm going to mean by the index of a K-theory class. OK. Um, so it, it, it would be nice if we had some, uh, some kind of elliptic operator on this infinite dimensional space, and we could take um, and we could take we could take that operator and pair it with these k-theory classes and somehow rigorously take the index of that thing. That would be that would be nice, but um, seems exceedingly difficult to do, very technical to do. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has seriously attempted to do this. Anyway, so so what we'll be doing is we're going to pass to a finite dimensional submanifold of the Hamiltonian loop group space, and we'll be doing index theory on that finite dimensional submanifold. Um, so I'm going to fix a maximal torus inside my group. So capital T and uh, Gothic T is going to be the Lie algebra. And now, yeah, so the moment map, the moment map goes from the Hamiltonian loop group space into LG star. And if you remember, I said that um, the Lie algebra G sits inside LG star as constant connections. That's the constant connections on the circle. And of course, the Lie algebra of T sits inside that, it's yet smaller. 
typically, typically this moment map is not going to be transverse to, to this subspace. I mean, transverse in the sense of differential geometry, um, that the image of the, um, the tangent map is, um, is transverse to the subspace. Yeah, so there's no guarantee that that's the case. But uh, it turns out that it's always possible to kind of thicken, to make this subspace a little bit larger, flatten it a little bit, um, so that you get you get some you get a submanifold that is transverse to the moment map. Okay, um, and this this basically follows from the equivariance of the moment map. I'm not sure if I emphasized it, but the moment map is LG equivariant uh, for for this LG action, this very important LG action on on the space of connections, this gauge action. Okay, and it basically follows from that. Um, if, if you kind of study the gauge action, what it looks like, um, it follows from that that you can thicken this T. Um, there's a nice way to thicken this T by adding um, this many dimensions, dimension of G mod T dimensions. Um, I didn't say that quite right. This many dimensions um, in order to get something that's uh, transverse to the moment map. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call I'm going to call um, I'm going to call this this space that's transverse to the moment map R. Okay, and uh, I think I mentioned it on the next slide anyway. Yeah, and and I'm going to take it to be to be closed. It's going to be a manifold, some manifold with boundary. Its geometry is very simple. I'll mention it on the next slide. You you could also take its interior. Um, it's not really a big difference. And then, so so once you have something that's transverse, you can just take its inverse image under the moment map, and that will be that will be a nice smooth submanifold. And because of the properness of the moment map, um, it will be smooth. It will be, or sorry, it will be finite dimensional. Yeah, it will be smooth because of transversality. It will be finite dimensional because of the properness. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I just put this in a yellow box to because it will be very important through through the rest of my talk. Um, this space. So, what are the properties of this space? Um, so, one one property is is that um, okay? I I mentioned that the geometry of this R is very sim simple. Its dimension is dimension of the Lie algebra G. It's finite dimensional, um, and it's just diviomorphic to T times the closure of a ball in T perp. Uh, T, T perp is the complement of T inside G. It's just diffeomorphic to that, but it's not. It's not. Um, it's not. Uh, the, the the embedding the embedding of this space into LG star is not uh, trivial. It's kind of uh, twisted. Um, so it's not true. So here's maybe a remark: is that it's um, not true that um, mu m is transverse. to um, G star or to G. Um, so what, what you have to do, um, or, or, or yeah, so, so it, it doesn't have to do with the size of this ball or anything. It's not, it's not true that um, if, you take, if you take this space and embed it in the naive way inside LG star, it's not true that the moment map is inverse to that. Um, so what you have to do is in, embed embed this space in a way that kind of twists around as you move farther out um, in, in, in LG star. Um, so you have to embed this in kind of a twisted way in order to get something that's uh, transverse to the moment map. Um, um, sorry, Yanis, uh, I'm not sure this B epsilon is not just uh, some kind of neighborhood of zero in T prop, so it's, it's, it's a wrong intuition. It, it is it is some neighborhood of zero in in T perp. Yeah, yeah. I guess I didn't write that down. So this is this is meant to be an epsilon ball in in T perp. Yeah, but 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 what I mean to say is that um, uh, the yeah. Um, what I mean to say, okay, you you can think of R as being this space. But its embedding into LG star is not kind of the first one you would think of, the, the easiest one you would think of. The, the easiest one you would think of would be to think of this as sitting inside G 
And I already told you that G sits inside LG star is constant connecting. So that's not, that's not the embedding. Um, okay, so that, that, that's maybe a slightly, slightly tricky point, but um, anyways, yeah. So, so I, I guess the claim is that there's a finite dimensional, let me phrase it in a different way. There's a finite dimensional submanifold of LG star, um, which is um, diffeomorphic, diffeomorphic to this thing on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, the moment map is transverse to that. Um, okay, and another property is that, um, so a certain subgroup, a subgroup of the loop group acts, acts on this R, preserves this R. So um, the maximal torus itself sits inside the loop group as constant, constant loops, certain constant loops, constant loops that take the values in T. And um, there's also a lattice that acts on R. So if you take, yeah, together, by the way, this, this product is the group of closed geodesics in, in the torus. Yeah, so a closed geodesic will have some initial point. The initial point is, is in T. And, um, and, then, and then if you normalize the initial point so that it starts at the identity in T, that's the lattice pi. That's closed. That's, um, yeah, a, another way to say it is that this is the kernel of the exponential map for the torus. That's what this lattice is, OK? So there, there's this lattice in inside T. Maybe I didn't say that, but pi is a lattice inside inside T that that also acts. Okay. The the way that the way that pi that this lattice pi acts on on this part of R is just by translation. Pi is a lattice inside T, and it just acts on this space by translation. Okay. Um, but but we 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 thicken that space in such a way that pi still acts on on the thickening. It still acts on R, okay. And this quotient R, R mod pi is is compact. Yeah, it, it identifies identifies with um, a closed uh, subset of uh, G. Okay, and what this means is that this manifold X that we got by taking inverse image, it's, it's a smooth finite dimensional manifold with, with boundary. I, I, I'm keeping the boundary around because that's convenient for analysis to have, um, to have this kind of partial compactification. That's conven convenient for the analysis. Um, that's why I'm keeping it around. Um, and, and the important thing, I guess, is that this quotient X mod pi is, is compact. And maybe I should mention um, this this space X that I'm talking about. If you're familiar with Jeffrey Kerwan's work, um, th this space X that I'm talking about is basically a variation on what they call extended moduli spaces. It has the advantage that um, so so their their extended moduli space is a little bit easier to write down explicitly, but it's it has the disadvantage that it's that it's singular in general. Um, so this X has the advantage that it's non-singular. We've we've modified their construction a little bit to make it non-singular, um, but uh, it's a little bit less explicit, as as you saw up here. Yeah, we know that it's diffeomorphic to this to this rather concrete, very simple thing, but um, but uh, the the embedding into LG star is not completely easy to describe. Um, and yes, and, and there's, there's a map from another, another nice property that sort of shows that X is under, nicely under control is that um, if you take the moment map, which goes from X to X to R, um, you, can, you can compose that with projection onto T. And that, that composition, which I'm going to call mu, that, that's going to be a proper map. Okay, so this, this manifold X is, is non-compact, but it's very much under control in the sense that we have a lattice acting um, such that the quotient is compact. And, and another, another related feature is that we have this moment map from it to T, which is proper. So you might, you might say that very crudely X looks like, X looks like something compact times, times, T times a vector space, very crudely, yeah? maybe in, in the sense of course, 
some kind of course equivalence or something. Okay. Um, so, so that's what this space X looks like geometrically. And uh, okay, here's here's a result from previous work with Eckhart Meinrank and, and Yan Li Song. So um, this space X turns out to have a canonical spin C structure. Um, so I think I think Eckhart mentioned this briefly, maybe in response to a question yesterday, um, how this spin C structure is is constructed. Um, so I might I might not talk about it anymore, but um, yeah, it, it it's not it's not so easy, I guess, to get all the technical details right. But it turns out that um, this space X has a canonical spin C structure. So for me, a spin C structure. I'm going to think of it as a module for the Clifford algebra. So you, you choose a Ramanian metric on um, tangent bundle of X, you build the, the Clifford algebra in the usual way from that Ramanian metric and, and that thing acts on this bundle. So yeah, this thing is a bundle of irreducible modules for that bundle of algebras. And one very interesting and kind of important thing is that um, so remember, this, this space X has an action of T times times pi, this group of closed geodesics in the torus. This, this spinner module is not quite equivariant for that, for that group. Um, it's equivariant instead for a central extension of that group. And where the central extension comes from is way back a few slides ago, I guess, when I talked about the central extension of the loop group. So it's that it's that central extension. So this t times pi sits inside the loop group. It it is it is the space of closed geodesics in the torus. So it is some subgroup of the loop group. And you can restrict the central extension to that subgroup. That gives you a central extension of of this group. And then um, this was my notation. So remember there was there was a little l uh, that labeled uh, sort of the different. Uh, central extensions. There's a basic one which corresponds to L equals one, and then um, you can take tensor powers of it to get um, to get uh, to get more central extensions. And this particular one, the L, this integer L is is this number H check, um, which is the dual dual Coxeter number of G. So it's some Lie theoretic, some Lie theoretic constant. Okay. Um, and more generally, you could consider other spinner modules, um, spin C structures that you get by taking this canonical one and tensoring by a line bundle. Okay, um, and we always, th throughout the rest of the talk, we want, and 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 this is also true um, in Telemann Woodward, we we want this level, um, what what I'm calling the level, this integer L um, that corresponds to the central extension of the the central extension that acts on this thing, we want that L to be positive. Yeah. Um, if it's zero, um, kind of everything breaks down, doesn't work. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, in, in particular, it means we want this, this line bundle L, its level, meaning the, the uh, power of the central extension that acts on it, we want it to be at least uh, minus H check plus one. We want it to be bigger than minus H check in order that this tensor product have have a good level. Okay, and and I guess I guess a small remark that um, yeah, in, in in the Verlin formula, um, a slightly different condition appears. So there there you want the level to be actually strictly positive. Um, it's a it's a more stringent condition. Yeah, so so this is because the Verlin formula involves some um, some quantization commutes with reduction business, and for that you need the level to be at least that. At some point, um, but but yeah, in the in the Telemann Woodward theorem, we actually don't worry about the quantization commutes with, with reduction business, um, so we don't need to impose uh, impose quite as strong a condition. Okay, um, so what can you do with a, a spinner bundle? Uh, you can build the Dirac operator. So if you pick if you pick a Riemannian metric on your space and a connection, you can build a Dirac operator. This is just the usual formula for the Dirac operator in, in terms of a local orthonormal frame. And um, yeah, this Dirac operator will act on smooth, smooth sections of this bundle. Um, and I want to think of it as an operator over the interior of X. 
Yeah. So we'll actually be doing we'll actually be doing um, kind of index theory on the interior of this space, of this space X. The, having having the boundary is maybe convenient for analytic purposes. It's good to keep the boundary around to um, to manage the analysis. It's not yeah, it's not so so important. Okay. Um, this is actually not quite the operator that that we work with um, because because uh, so um, a short time ago, I guess I told you that uh, I started out by telling you that the moment map is not always transverse to the Lie algebra of the maximal torus, uh, but we we can thicken thicken it in order to obtain something that is. But uh, morally speaking, we actually we actually kind of want to do um, index theory on this kind of singular space. And there's a kind of standard, stand, well, almost standard, I think, trick to deal with that, um, which uh, I believe we, we th this also appears in Jeffrey Kirwan's paper in the cohomological context, for example. Um, so so the, the kind of standard trick is that you, you work with the operator on this thickened space, on this X or on this interior of X, that's not, um, and you, but you twist it by uh, by a, a Poincaré dual. So in Jeffrey Kirwan's paper, they um, they use a cohomological Poincaré dual. They use like a Tom form. Uh, in this case, we want to use a k-theoretic a k-theoretic Poincaré dual. So so a bot Tom class. Okay. So we need to twist this. We take this operator and we twist it by um, by uh, basically the Poincaré dual. Of, of this space inside inside R naught. Okay. And, and that, that produces a new a new uh, Dirac type operator that acts on a slightly larger bundle. It acts on S tensor, a spin module for this subspace D curve. Um, but it's yeah. Um, it, 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 it's still a Dirac Dirac type operator, but it, it will have so, so roughly speaking, what it, what this operator looks like, it looks like my original Dirac operator, uh, plus uh, some zeroth order term, and the zeroth order term acts like a potential um, as you approach the boundary of X. It it acts like a potential. So it, um, yeah, that, that that that's maybe the best the best way to put it. Yeah. So it's so it's something it, it's the k-theoretic version of um, uh, using a, a Tom form using a Tom form that was supported uh, the pullback of a Tom form that's supported near this subspace inside here. Okay, so th this is the this is the actual operator this this d here. Sorry, I guess it's getting a little bit messy. This d here is the actual operator that um, that we work with. Okay, and mo morally, as I said, morally it's Morally, it's like doing index theory on this space, um, except that that space might be singular. So we've we've uh, worked around it. Okay. Um, so here I put kind of a bit of a summary of this kind of index theoretic business. So I guess just to kind of summarize what I've said so far, uh, we're studying these Hamiltonian loop group spaces. So they have an action of the loop group, a moment map into LG star into the space of connections on the circle. Um, we're actually looking at this finite dimensional submanifold inside this loop group. That's where we're going to be doing index theory. It has an action of this group of closed geodesics in the torus. Um, the space X is non-compact, uh, but the analysis is still going to be under control, roughly speaking, because this quotient is, is compact. And then we talked about the fact that this X also has a, um, a canonical uh, spin C structure. And so we can build this generalized, this Dirac type operator um, acting on smooth sections over that space. Okay. And um, right. And although X, although the space X is non-compact, so if you have if you have a compact manifold and you have a Dirac operator, uh, the kernel and the co-kernel will be finite dimensional. And so you'll have a well-defined index, the index of, of, of a Fredholm operator being the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. So in this case, our, our manifold X, or really the interior of X, is, is non-compact. Um, 
So that's not guaranteed to be the case. And in fact, it's not the case. The kernel and the co-kernel are infinite dimensional, but uh, there's something that kind of uh, saves, saves us, which is that there's also a T action around the torus. Um, so so this, this central extension um, acts on the spinner module and inside this group is a copy, is a copy of the torus. The torus embeds inside this group canonically. I guess I didn't mention that. But it means that um, the torus acts on, on the kernel of this operator. Yeah, the operator is equivariant, all of that stuff. The torus acts on the kernel. And it turns out that the weight, the, the, um, each of the weight spaces for that T action is finite dimensional. Yeah, so you take the L2 kernel, oops, you take the L2 kernel of um, L2 kernel of this operator, T acts on that, each of the weight spaces is finite dimensional. Okay. Um, and what it means is that there is a kind of uh, generalized, this, this operator has a generalized index. So the index is not, normally the equivariant index would be some representation of the torus. Here it's not quite that because, um, because it's infinite dimensional, but it, it still uh, gives a well-defined element in, in this space. In, um, so, so this is, this is my notation, R minus infinity T. So, so R of T, I guess I didn't write this down. R of T is gonna be my notation for the representation ring of T. Um, R minus infinity of T is the formal completion of that. So you take um, infinite, uh, infinite uh, formal linear combinations of, char of irreducible characters of the torus with uh, integer coefficients. So if you like, it's the set of functions from uh, lambda is my notation for the weight lattice or hom t u1. Um, so if you like, it's, it's the set of integer valued functions from this lattice lambda to uh, the integers, yeah, where the, uh, the value at some highest weight is a multiplicity of that um, weight. Okay, so there, there is some well-defined T equivariant index, uh, it, it, even though it's infinite dimensional, it's just we have to allow uh, infinite uh, linear combinations of irreducible characters. Okay, um, yeah, and, and I should mention that the key, that this is not such a hard thing to prove, that the key thing is really uh, this level condition. Yeah, so roughly speaking, how the proof goes is that, um, yeah, maybe I should mention something about this um, because it's kind of interesting, but, but uh, inside this group, inside this uh, centrally extended group, um, if you take an element in the torus, so the torus turns out to sit inside this group naturally, and you take uh, the lift of some element in the, the lift of some element in the lattice. So let's say I take an element in the lattice and let's let eta hat be, be something in the, something that lifts it, something in the central extension, okay? Then it turns out that these things obey a Heisenberg-like commutation relation. So they obey relation T eta hat equals um, a phase factor eta hat T. And the phase factor is T to the eta. <laughs> so eta here, um, eta is in pi, um, but pi, Pi, um, remember I said we were going to be using this uh, basic inner product to identify the Lie algebra with its dual kind of throughout the talk. Under that ident identification, Pi sits inside the weight lattice. Yeah, um, so that's using the identification given by the inner product. Um, and so this, this thing makes sense. So this is um, the weight eta applied to this element of the torus. It's some phase factor, it's something in U1. So this is just a phase factor, something you want. So there's this kind of um, Heisenberg-like uh, commutation relation. And that turns out to be the key fact. And roughly speaking, what it means is that um, e even though X is non-compact, uh, if you say take something in the kernel and you translate it by an element in the lattice, uh, it's, it's the action of T on it will change by, by this amount, by eta basically the weight for the action of T on it will change by eta. Um, and that means that, that 
this can be turned into a rigorous argument, but basically that means that um, that uh, the, the the index when you uh, when you take the index, it's not um, it doesn't all concentrate in one weight space. It's not um, in one weight space for the torus. It gets kind of spread out because of this action. That's kind of anyway. That that can be turned. What I just said is not a rigorous argument, but that can be turned into a rigorous argument. Okay, so, so this is what I'm going to mean by, by index, essentially. We're going to be working with this operator on this finite dimensional space. Um, so, so that's the operator that we'll be twisting with, with K-theory classes. That's kind of the idea. So the next thing I want to talk about is what, what are these K-theory classes that we're, we're interested in? Okay, um, so I'm going to go back to these moduli space examples and tell you about the Atiyah bot classes, which are really the classes that we're, we're interested in. So yeah, so this is just a very quick, I copied basically what was, one, what was on an earlier slide. This, this just to remind you, this moduli space is, is uh, sorry, this loop group space is a quotient of flat connections by subgroup of the gauge group. Okay, I'm gonna fix a finite dimensional um, representation of the group. I can, I form this uh, trivial bundle over the surface. So I just take sigma across this V. I'll call that V, v underline. It's just a trivial bundle over, over the surface. Okay. And the gauge, the gauge group acts on this, on this bundle in not, not a terribly interesting way. What 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 you do, um, well, in a I guess it is quite an interest, it turns out to be quite interesting the way it acts, but um, it's it's sort of tautological. So what you do is you you have a gauge transformation. So gauge transformation gamma, this is some map from sigma to G. Okay. If you're at some point, so P, this is a point um, in sigma. If you're at some point in sigma um, and you have some vector, this is in V, some vector in V, the way the gauge transformation acts, it, it sends this uh, point in the vector bundle to, well, it preserves the point. It doesn't do anything on the base on sigma. And it, um, it acts on V. Oh, I should have put the representation in here, IV in here. It acts on the vector by, you take the gauge transformation, you evaluate it at that point, you plug it into the representation, and that's how it acts on, on the fiber. Yeah. So the way this gauge group is acting, just to repeat, it's not doing any on the, anything on the base of sigma. It's only, act, it's only doing something in the fibers. And the way it's acting in the fibers is basically through the evaluation map of the gauge transformation at that, and, and using this representation. So um, use, using this, you can construct a vector bundle. Um, the vector bundle doesn't live over M, but it lives over this product, M, M times sigma. Yeah. And what you do is you, yeah, so remember M itself, I guess it was, it was, up, it was up here. So M itself is this, is this quotient of flat connections mod gauge transformation. Um, so what, what I do is I just take flat connections times this bundle over sigma. When I take the product of those things, that's some uh, vector bundle over flat connections times sigma. And I take the, you take the quotient by uh, the diagonal action of this normal subgroup. So maybe um, it might have been a little bit a little bit clearer to include one extra step. So this is this is a vector bundle over a flat times sigma mod g del g partial. Yeah, in in, in the obvious way because the underline is a is a bundle over that. And now if you look at if you look at this quotient, remember I said g partial acts trivial on sigma. It doesn't do anything on sigma itself. It's only in the fibers. So so this space is actually just the same as m times sigma. Okay. Because because a flat mod g del is m. So I hope that's sort of clear. So this is a finite dimensional vector bundle over m times sigma, and it's uh, it's LG equivariant because basically for the same reason that m has an LG action on it. Yeah, this um, we only took a quotient by this uh, normal subgroup, so there's this residual action by by g mod g del which is, uh, this quotient is LG. So it's some LG equivariant vector bundle. 
over this product. And now the, the basic idea of, of how you um, obtain these Atiyah bot classes is you pick, you pick some submanifold of sigma. And what you do is you take, you take this bundle, this thing that I've called EV, you restrict it to that submanifold, and then you push forward down onto M. So, so this, this is my notation for the, for the push forward, for the wrong way map. You push forward along N, along this submanifold, down onto M. Okay, this is the basic idea of how you construct the Atiyah bot classes. And so there, there are three basic types of classes. You can take this you can take this submanifold n to be either zero dimensional, one dimensional, or two dimensional. Well, the, okay, we'll come back to the two dimensional case in a second. Um, and the, the parity here, depending depending on whether n is even or odd dimensional, you'll get either something in um, k zero or k one of this space. Um, oh, and I realize I just realized. Okay, yeah, this is an artifact of the fact that I changed some of my slides rather late in the game. I guess I haven't explained what this notation means. So this, this notation, um, RKG, M, this is what, this is what um, you might call the, well, it's the K-theory of M. It's, it's what you might call the topologist K-theory of M. So M is some infinite dimensional space. Um, and so the, there's a version of K-theory for locally compact spaces. There's a sort of compactly supported version. So that's not the version we're talking about here. Here we're really talking about um, homotopy classes of maps from M into Fredholm operators on, uh, I guess you can take them on, on, uh, on some Hilbert space that looks like this. Okay, um, so, so this, this is, the non-compactly supported K-theory, or another way to put it is the topologist version of K-theory, it's, um, yeah. This would be RK0. Yanis? Uh, yeah. Uh, so is it a possibly good point for a break or whatever, maybe next good point we should take the break? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, maybe in 30 seconds, okay. Yeah, so so the, the thing I wanted to say about this is that uh, if, if n is either zero or one dimensional, so if you take either a point or a curve, um, this, this, this construction kind of works, works directly. It makes sense. Um, but the, the most interesting case and hardest case is when, is when you want to take n to be two dimensional. Um, in other words, you want to take this n to be sigma itself. You want to push forward along sigma itself. Um, and then, then this, thing, this thing that I wrote down is actually not it's not immediately defined anyways, because sigma has a boundary. Remember, we're working with a, with a manifold with, with boundary. Um, so, so this thing is not immediately defined. So, so yeah, this is a good place to take a break. And I guess when I come back, I'll, I'll start talking about how you deal with this. <laughs> OK, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, I already see that Tamash has a question. So let me mute unmute and uh, Tamash, you will. Thank you. So thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, if you see relation, any relationship with the approach of um, Telemon and Woodward. They mentioned somehow that um, central to their proof maybe is some um, symmetry by Hecke operators on some of these index formulae. I don't know if you know this. Hecke operators acting on the stack of uh, bundles and, and some effect of this on their formula and then somehow that symmetry on something on the, I don't really understand what they do, but that's why I'm asking. Uh, does it have anything similar in your work? Do you see Hecke operators playing any role or some analog of that? Uh, so so I, 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 I confess that I also don't understand this point of their work. Um, what, one thing that could be related, but I'm not, I'm not sure because I don't know this heck of operator stuff. Uh, so what, what, one, of, one of the things I'm going to talk about is um, a, a bit later is, is going to involve um, how, how the lattice, so, so, so I'm gonna eventually, yeah, sh shortly I'm gonna construct some K-theory class anyways, even though there's a boundary. And um, 
it's not going to be equivariant under the lattice, um, but there's going to be some formula for how it transforms on, under the lattice. And I have a vague feeling that that, that maybe is somewhat related to that business. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but I'm not sure because I don't know the tech operator stuff. So yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I have, I have my very, by now very well-worn copy of, of their paper uh, here with me, but, but there's still many things in there that I don't, I don't understand. Um, yeah, I'm in some ways tried to come to this uh, sort of from, from scratch, just using differential geometry and index theory and so on. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments before the break? Uh, all right, so if not, let's have a break of 15 minutes and we resume at uh, uh, 6.10.